Hello and welcome to Maths on the Move, the podcast from plus.maths.org. I'm Rachel Thomas. In the summer, we came across some intriguing stories in the news saying that scientists were on the verge of discovering a new fundamental force of nature that they hadn't previously known about. Now, we already knew about four forces. We knew about gravity, the electromagnetic force, you've probably heard of both of those, and also the strong and weak nuclear forces. All of those forces, except gravity, are explained by something called the standard model of particle physics, which is an incredibly well-understood and well-tested, very successful theory of physics. So this new force would be a fifth force, and that would be a very important result. So Marianne went to see our friend Ben Alanak, who's Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge, to ask him about this. Now, Ben started off by telling Marianne that it's all to do with measurements that were made at the Fermilab Particle Accelerator in Illinois, in America. And the experiment is called the Fermilab Muon G-2 experiment, and this looks at how fundamental particles called muons move around in a magnetic field. You can think of fundamental particles as the building blocks of nature, And you actually, everyone's already heard of one, the electron, which is one of the best known examples. Now, the muons involved in this experiment are about 200 times more massive than electrons. And you can think of muons a bit like a spinning top, where it's spinning around the axis of a magnetic field. But as muons spin, they also wobble a bit. And this wobble can be measured with just an incredible degree of accuracy. And the new Fermilab measurement conflicts with what the standard model predicts that wobble should be for the muon. So here's Ben picking up the story about the problem of the wobble. So what you want to do is to be able to predict that with the theory to a similar level of precision, of accuracy and precision, and then compare the two numbers. And if the two numbers are different, then the theory's wrong, obviously. And because, the, because you can measure so many digits, there might be tiny differences between the two numbers, which are due to new physical effects, which you weren't aware of in any other uh, experiment, which have shown up here. So it's what's called an indirect measurement. You're not seeing something directly, but you're measuring some quantity which is sensitive to new forces, new particles, which you didn't know about. So in this case, in these observations, there was a disagreement with the theoretical... Yes. Um, so actually, the first measurement was uh, in the late 90s, and there seemed to be uh, a, a significant disagreement then. Uh, but the problem is that's one experiment, and always in particle physics, for, for big claims especially, but actually in general, you really want two different experiments to independently check, because perhaps one experiment made a mistake, uh, you know, lots of things can go wrong at this cutting edge of research and you want to be sure before you accept the evidence. So um, there's been a new, very, even much more precise experiment made uh, in Fermilab and uh, they they released their first data a few years ago and they've released more data earlier this year um, and that's why this new news came up um, and they um, indeed find uh, a large discrepancy with the theoretical prediction. Um, So it confirms the old result from the late 90s and it disagrees with the standard model of particle physics and so you have to add new particles or new force and or new forces to the standard model of particle physics that we didn't know about before in order to get the two numbers to agree if that's the correct interpretation. Um, And perhaps we should explain briefly um, so, so, so you're talking about new particles that might be causing the wobbling of the muon. Um, how do we go from there to a force? Yes, yeah. so we use this framework called quantum field theory. And what quantum field theory, it's, it's the level of quantum underneath ordinary quantum mechanics. It tells you how particles can be created and absorbed. Um, and actually, if really, forces are carried by particles, by quantum excitations of particles. So when you see light, 
one way of describing that is that there are particles of light, photons, hitting the back of your retina and being absorbed. And so, and the electromagnetic force actually, so magnetism is exchange of these photons, many, many quanta or packets of these photons are being exchanged. And so really a force is a, a force is the exchange of a particle. So if you have two magnets, what's happening that, you know, perhaps you put the North Poles together and they repel. What's happening is one of the magnets is emitting a lot of photons or photonic fields. And there you can think of them, roughly speaking, as hitting the other magnet and pushing it, pushing them apart. Mm. They have momen these particles have momentum, transfer momentum and push them apart. So that's how a new particle can also be a new force. Yes, because it's exactly. the, the carrying, force carrying particle. So the unexplained behaviour of the muon that Fermilab has measured could be down to a new fundamental force carried by a new fundamental particle that's not included in the standard model. But there's a but. The calculations you need to make to see what the standard model predicts the muon wobble should be, these calculations are incredibly difficult and indeed some of them are actually impossible to do. So there's various things that you can do to overcome this difficulty and this impossibility. One thing you can do is use a supercomputer to simulate the processes that the difficult bits of the calculations describe. These difficult bits are actually quantum processes that happen in a vacuum. You can then stick the output from your simulation back into your calculation. One collaboration which does these simulations is called the BMW collaboration because they're based in Budapest, Marseille and Wuppertal. In 2020, they published their results and their prediction for how the muon should be wobbling more or less agrees with the Fermilab measurements. So... There's no disagreement between measurement and theory if you're doing your theoretical calculations the BMW way using the simulations run by the BMW collaboration. But these calculations that disagree with the measurements were made in a different way, not using the BMW simulation. Here's Ben again to explain. What they did was not use this computer simulation. They used instead... Um, Date experimental measurements to estimate the bits that are hard to calculate. So other other experiments, low energy electron positron scattering, you can re you can use in theory to relate their production of pions in particular to this piece that you can't calculate. And so you can do some maths, but turn the measurements into uh, a number which goes into this calculation. So is this a bit like, say, if I wanted to use Newton's laws of motion to calculate what happens when I kick a football or I kick a succession of them and I don't really feel like doing the, I can't do the calculation for one part of that, so I just actually go and kick a football to measure how it behaves and stick that into the con yes. calculation? Is it a bit like that? Yes. So it's replacing a hard bit of maths with observation. Yeah, right. There's okay. a little bit of maths to do on the measurements, but the, the, we, that maths is is not difficult, and we understand it. And uh, so you, you use the measurements, stick it through a little bit of machinery, which isn't difficult, and then you can get a number to to put in. Yeah, exactly. So then, basically, it's those calculations that involve the theory, but with a bit of data replacing a bit of the theory, that lead to the discrepancy between the theoretical calculation augmented by data and the observation of the muon precession wobbling. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Right, okay. And there's recently there's been um, another measurement of these kicking of the footballs um, earlier this year and it disagrees with all the previous measurements. <laughs> so you can see it's quite an, a, a tricky and messy experimental situation and actually at the cutting edge of science it's often like this um, you know, things get settled eventually, off, you know, hopefully. But uh, when you're discovering things, it's, it's tricky and you don't know exactly where you stand and so on. And so there's uh, an experiment called CMD3 in Novosibirsk in, in Russia. And they've measured electron-positron scattering into two pions 
And when you take their measurement, shove it through this machinery, calculate this extra piece, it explains the difference. It agrees both with the supercomputer calculation of the, of the vacuum, um, and it agrees with the standard model computation. Now, it disagrees with the other experiments that are measuring electron-positron scattering into two pions by quite a lot. Um, and, in fact, the other experiments that go in, they also disagree a bit with each other. So the experimental situation is quite messy uh, in, the theoretical, in, in the prediction for the standard model. So what's going on then, do you think? I mean, do you think there's serious new physics there, such as a new force that people hadn't known about before that, that means that the theory as it is is wrong because it doesn't include these new bits? Or do you think it's a matter of um, something having gone wrong in the calculations? We, at the moment, we don't know, we don't know um, which has gone wrong. But the good news is we will, we will find out which of those options it is in the next few years because... Other experiments are going to repeat these measurements with electron-positron into pions, and um, that, so they can check which of the experimental measurements is correct. And that situation should settle down, hopefully, um, and solve whether it's whether it whether it's those that are the problem or not. So this would mean that the problem lies in the observations that are being made in order to plug into the theoretical calculation for these difficult for bits. these difficult bits so yeah. that's the football so that's like something wrong with the measurement of how a football flies that yes. I wanted to stick into my calculation yeah. to make it easier so if that's wrong then that yeah so then that doesn't necessarily mean there's a new force or some new physics it just means that that bit of the calculation has gone wrong well it, yeah it means some other measurements were um, were wrong for some reason uh, which of course you'd like to know why uh, and yeah, that would be the that would be the interpretation. Now, if you want, so that's that's the real situation. We don't know, but we will know. But okay, if you're asking for my personal feeling, I suspect that this will mainly be um, a problem with the these measurements of the football. Um, because, and the reason I say that is because these supercomputer calculations, which ought to be um, I mean, well, uh, with this one particular BMW supercomputer calculation, which is the only one that's really accurate enough. Um, and so as long as that, as long as, you know, no one's put a, an error in line one or something, then there's no reason to suspect that that shouldn't work, that supercomputer calculation. And the new measurement from Russia agrees with, with that. Um, so I've got a sneaking uh, suspicion that that might be the answer. I hope it's not true because of course we all want to find new physics. And in fact, there's been a lot of work. Many people have worked on, you know, what kind of new physics it could be. Uh, what does it mean in terms of, you know, other theories of the universe? There's been loads of work on that over the years, as well as work on the standard model um, prediction as well. Mm. So a lot of us are sort of rooting for the um, beyond the standard model um, explanation. But I've got a bit of a sinking feeling that it might not be. But, <laughs> but, but we have to see. I mean, the data will tell us. Yeah, right? but it's very interesting, perhaps for people who are not physicists. Um, I think it's not that well known that what you guys want is actually new physics. So you're not sitting there thinking, oh, I want my theory that I like the most to be completely correct. You're sitting there going, oh, I want to see something new that hasn't been explained yet. Yeah, because that's really interesting. And then there'd be... A whole other um, thing to chase in terms of the research and find out about, and it might, whatever we find, will hopefully explain some mysteries that we currently, you know, can't answer. And like there are plenty. There are plenty of those. Like, what would be your favourite one to get, have answered? So, for example, the um, the fundamental. There's a class of fundamental particles called fermions. They've got a certain amount of spin. They make up. Uh, electrons and muons are, are examples of them, uh, but also the particles that uh, make up the inner bits of the atoms, the quarks, they've got a weird pattern of mass masses. Between the lightest and the heaviest, there's a factor of a million in the mass, okay? And they're sort of, they're spread out logarithmically, so one's ten times heavier than the other, one's a hundred times, one's a thousand times, one's ten thousand times. 
more or less. And we, the, it looks like there's structure there. And we don't, currently they're just fixed at, at uh, random. Uh, and you would naively expect that they'd all be more or less the same, roughly. Um, but they're not. So um, that's called the fermion mass problem. And I think um, there ought to be a good option if for fi finding out why, uh, you know, why the theory requires this and how that uh, comes to be. And a, a potential new particle which could explain this spin wobble might be a, a kind of crowbar to help to lead you in the right, out of the right door, to, uh, in the right direction. Interesting. So you said we'll know, we'll find out soon, like in two or three years, which for, you know, might surprise people as well, because that's quite a long time in some other way. So why do these things take so long? I mean, what is it about the experiments that takes a long time? Is it that it takes time to gather enough data to, to analyze it? or? Yeah, so you're, well, first of all, these experiments are highly complicated things. The ones that I'm talking about now, they're not just, uh, they're not, 20 meters uh, rings. The, these are hundreds of meters long accelerators, and you you know you you got to tune the beams, and sometimes the you have funny events, and the whole thing's shorts or you know it's quite they're, they're complicated machines with a lot of bits, and they're difficult to run. And the fact is, you need a lot of collisions, um, so you have to have to take years of day a year's data or something. Try and run it as much as you can for a year, and often they're run on twenty-four hour cycles. So people are staying up all night, you know, doing shifts in the night to try and take the data, and then you, um, then you've got to analyze it, and you want to check everything to make sure you understand exactly what's going on and measure the bits that you don't initially understand, so that you can get a really accurate answer out and you can trust it. Because one, you have these things called systematic errors, which are basically things that you've missed in the experimental setup. And when you're trying to get a really accurate answer out, as we need for this, you know, you don't want to miss something which uh, will change the final uh, results. So that takes time as well to uh, analyze the data and try and make sure that you've not, um, you've not messed anything up. Um, so yeah, that can, that can take sort of a year as well. So you can, you can spend a year taking the data easily spend a year uh, analyzing it and convincing yourself you've got the answer right mm -hmm. even with lots of people doing all of that yeah amazing um and and three years in particle physics isn't a long time scale these times i mean the large hadron collider was conceived of in the 80s and finally came into being in the 2000s and it's still running now and will run to the late 30s at least um so um yeah you need a lot of data and so you know decades are often these days a normal time scale um, so we're that's why I'm saying that two or three years is quite short sure. for us you know. yeah um, is there anything about this <laughs> that um, will make a difference in a sort of application way in some at some point is there anything that you could see on the horizon where it's the discovery of this kind of potential bit of new physics might have something up Application? Uh, application to society? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Uh, currently, no. Uh, mm. we're, we're all, the thing is, we're all focused on just finding out at the moment where, you know, how the universe is and how it works and, and so on. Um, those kind of applications tend to come later because, I mean, the, the kind of burning issue for us is is this a new particle? Is it a new force? Uh, once you found it, then, you know, you might start thinking of some applications. So if you go back 100 years um, up the road at the Cavendish Laboratory, J. 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 Thompson was discovering the electron actually over 100 years. Uh, I don't think he any, had any idea when he created it that um, it would underlie the theory of electronics and CD players or, you know, whatever, or, uh, you know, Spotify and etc. So that, that tends to come a bit later after the discoveries, and, and we're in that position. I mean, there's been no, as far as I know, there have been no uh, industrial or technological applications thought of yet. But, um, so it's a bit like pure mathematics. You will have to wait sometimes for it. You have to wait, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right.
So, as Ben said, we're going to have to wait to find out if this is a new force, and it may not be one, and we may never find a new force. But what this conversation with Ben has given us is a fascinating glimpse into into life at the cutting edge of physics and it's clearly it's hard work both intellectually and experimentally and the work takes a lot of time and a lot of collaboration and sharing of knowledge between all the different scientists working on these problems but also it shows us that life at the cutting edge of physics is also incredibly exciting and I'm always amazed by the fact that what physicists are often physicists like Ben are often most excited about is the possibility that their theories are wrong. It's such a um, strange and exciting way to work. So we'll definitely keep our ears to the ground. We'll keep talking to Ben and we'll let you know when this particular mystery has been resolved. You can find out more about the standard model of particle physics and about quantum field theory, which Ben mentioned, by going to plus.maths.org and entering those terms into the search box. And you can also see lots of content we've produced with Ben Alanak by entering Alanak into the search box. And we've also put links for those things into the show notes. Thanks for listening and bye for now. <laughs>